Hello and Chicken Saints, I'm Jared Halverson and I have been looking forward to this week for, well, for four years now. In fact, many of you have been looking forward to this as well. Today we begin our deep dive into what is affectionately known as the Isaiah chapters. And we will have two weeks on this. Uh, they are the 12 straight chapters of Isaiah that, that seem to act as an impermeable barrier for anyone trying to make their way through 2 Nephi. From chapter 12 of 2 Nephi all the way to chapter 24, it's solid Isaiah, uninterrupted. And that, that has proved to be difficult for way too many of us as members of the church. For some, in fact, don't feel bad if that's you, because that was Boyd K. Packer. Elder Packer said when he was young, he would read the Book of Mormon and never seem to have enough momentum to make it through the Isaiah chapters. And so he'd give up and then have to start again and still bump up against that barrier every time. And the thought of keeping, oh, King Benjamin, holding him hostage to some difficult chapters from Isaiah, that's totally unfair. And so we have to be able to make it through these Isaiah chapters and not just make it through it, this, in some ways, is the climax of what Nephi is trying to convey. He talks about, uh, in, his, in his writings, I'm going to include the most sacred part. Now, everything I'm going to include, I consider sacred, but there's levels to this, okay? And from, from our understanding of what he, the way he lays out his writings, the, the sacred center of everything that Nephi gives us in First and Second Nephi basically are the Isaiah chapters. Essentially, it's from uh, 2 Nephi 6 through 2 Nephi 30. That's the canon within the canon for Nephi. That's the, the most sacred of the sacred things. And last week we began that, but what was it? It was Jacob teaching Isaiah. Then what? It's Isaiah teaching Isaiah. And then what? It's Nephi teaching Isaiah. The whole thing. Th this is the grand message of everything that Nephi is trying to to organize his small plates around. Uh, he already has the history in the large plates and, and, and yeah, Mormon, go ahead and abridge that all you want, but don't abridge this. Don't editorialize. I already have. Uh, don't shorten, don't condense, don't redact, just leave it in this pristine form that Nephi gave it to us. And the fact that the Lord would allow the 116 pages to be lost, but to preserve this it lets you know how the Lord feels about these, these passages as well. So buckle up. Uh, we are going to be going as close to verse by verse as we can because it's so essential. Uh, we're going to not worry too much about time and give these chapters the attention they deserve. Many of you four years ago said, why did you start in Jacob? Why did you skip the Isaiah chapters? And it's not that I skipped them. I taught them in my classes. But that's, Jacob is when COVID hit. It's almost as if we tried so hard to make it through the Isaiah chapters that it just ruined our immune systems. And as soon as we were done with 2 Nephi, uh, the, there was a pandemic on, the, on a worldwide scale. Okay, So we are, we are going to go back. We are going to dig in. We're going to try to make sense of everything that Nephi is giving us this week and next week. And honestly, today especially, because we're not... Well, I'll put it this way. Nephi is going to explain what he's given us in Isaiah, just like Jacob did last time uh, with his Isaiah chapters. Uh, but that's going to be the end of next week's lesson. That's 2 Nephi 25, and then moving on into the, the following week into 26 and 27 and 28 and so on. Uh, so we've got some amazing things ahead these next three weeks. I'm going to spend less time today on talking about why Nephi is including this and save much of that for next week when, he, when we'll let him do it himself. Uh, but for us to understand what he's, what he's including and to make sure that we understand the Isaiah that he's... Well, I'll put it this way. The first time he uses... The first time Nephi quotes Isaiah is at the end of 1 Nephi. And he quotes Isaiah 48 and 49. Then you remember he passes the baton to Jacob and says, Hey, will you pick up where I left off and repeat this all-important passage from Isaiah 49? Uh, about kings and queens and shoulders and nursing, nursing fathers and nursing mothers, the Gentiles gathering scattered Israel home. And Jacob does that and then builds on it with chapter 50 and chapter 51 and the beginning of 52. Uh, Abinadi will take that baton and run with 52 and then 53. And then Jesus will take that baton and go back to 52, skip 53, and then teach 54. Uh, it's an amazing Isaiah relay race throughout the entire 
uh, breadth of the Book of Mormon. It's amazing. But what, one thing that you see there is it's all those, the end, near, near the end of the, book, of, of the book of Isaiah. It's chapter 48 through 54. Now, Isaiah scholars have long wrestled with what they consider this difficulty in Isaiah because it seems to be coming from two completely different angles. Uh, from Isaiah 1 through about Isaiah 39, it's much more, oh, justice. It's much more historical. It's what's going on in Isaiah's day. It's kind of in your face and you've got to clean up your act and so on. And then chapter 40 begins with such a different it, actually, there's even a break because like Isaiah 36 to 39 is in prose when the rest of the book is all in poetry. So it's almost like, let's pause this. Let's, let's pause the epic poem that, that Isaiah is giving us. Teach some prose history just to get you up to speed of what you would have seen in the book of Kings, for example, uh, of what's happening with the Assyrian onslaught. And then we'll get back to our poetry. Uh, and it's, it's with that second half that we see so much more mercy we see so much more prophecy. We see it was, it was so dark and bad news, the first half of Isaiah, and so beautiful and reassuring in the second half of Isaiah, to the point that many scholars say, this can't be coming from the same guy. There has to be a first Isaiah who wrote the first 39 chapters, and then there's got to be a second Isaiah, or deutero Isaiah, as they, as they label him, that, that, that did the rest. Now, there, some scholars have even pushed beyond Deutero-Isaiah to a, a third Isaiah, a tertio uh, uh, Isaiah, and, and that for them, second Isaiah is just chapter 40 through 55, and then third Isaiah is 56 to 66. And there's all kinds, of, you, you can get into the, the scholarly weeds with that and, and understand why. One reason they c come up with this split, like I said, is the difference in tone. Let me come right back to that. Uh, because I do believe the same person can, can teach justice and mercy. Jesus did it all the time. Another reason they often split it is because there's so many clear prophecies in so-called second Isaiah that the thought is there's no way that anyone could tell the future that clearly. So clearly it must have been written after the fact. And then they're just backdating it and, and kind of sneaking it in with Isaiah's other writings to make the, the original Isaiah look really prophetic. Well, if you're premise is that there's no prophecy, then of course that's going to be your conclusion. But I don't share that premise. I do believe in the gift of prophecy and revelation. I do believe that God can help us see beyond what mere mortal eyesight can provide. And so if that's your criteria, then I, I don't agree with it from the start. Okay. Now there's some other I issues that people will raise. Uh, and so the, the clear well, I'll put it this way, uh, and for this we have some incredible Book of Mormon scholars to thank. Nephi quotes from both 1st and 2nd Isaiah. The Book of Mormon includes 1st and 2nd Isaiah. So that problematizes the, the thought that it must have been written by somebody 200 years after the fact, because that, then it wouldn't have been on the brass plates. However, and this is interesting, never in the Book of Mormon does it quote anything from so-called 3rd Isaiah. So maybe there is some truth to the idea of some later interpolations or, or editorial additions that come to the book of Isaiah. Uh, and so the book of Mormon itself would be okay with some possible third Isaiah that didn't make the cut on the brass plates. Uh, because again, they never quote from it. In fact, they never quote from Isaiah chapter 1 which is interesting because some scholars believe that chapter one was written along the same lines as the end of Isaiah uh, to kind of provide bookends for the whole thing to bring it all together. And when Nephi starts the, the Isaiah chapters today, he's, he seems to be starting right from the begin, his beginning, but it's chapter two. Never quotes from chapter one, never alludes to it. So there's some interesting things there. Uh, so first and second Isaiah, from a Latter-day Saint perspective, we would say, oh no, that's, that's all just Isaiah. Yet maybe some minor uh, tweaking that goes on after the fact. And we'd be okay with that. Mormon does that with his scripture all the time, right? Uh, we don't have a problem with redaction, as it's called. But a, to have a third one, maybe, that's, maybe that is possible. Uh, to have somebody after the fact that's adding things at the end that were not on the brass plates version. That's all possible. Uh, are we already too deep into the weeds? <laughs> maybe so. But let me get back to this idea of, of the tone from the justice of 
the, the first half of Isaiah to the mercy of the second half. That's actually inspired order. Uh, because in some ways, when we're trying to raise children, for example, we have to start with justice. Clear rules, and this is how we do things as a family, and that's good, and that's bad, and it's black and white thinking. Okay? And not only black and white, we start by very clearly specifying what, what's not allowed. Okay? We teach justice with our children. And it's as they grow up that they start learning that mercy is part of the picture as well. Uh, that it's not the end of the world that they made a mistake, that it's, it's going to be okay. Uh, in the creation, fall, atonement stages of life, creation is typically justice. Fall is where we start introducing mercy. And you can't reverse the order. If you try to raise your children on mercy alone, good luck trying to squeeze justice in after the fact. It won't be able to get a word in edgewise. So no wonder Isaiah begins with justice and then transitions into mercy. No wonder, the, no wonder the Old Testament is heavier on justice, though it includes mercy, and then the New Testament is heavier on mercy, though it includes justice. This is just God raising his children uh, and doing it in the best possible order. Uh, for us to understand the, the, the breaking point, by the way, in Isaiah is the scattering of the northern kingdom. He's down in the south in Judah, but the northern tribes, the ten tribes in the north in the, in the kingdom of Israel, or Ephraim it's sometimes called, after its birthright tribe, they have now been scattered by the Assyrian Empire. We're going to see in these Isaiah chapters warnings about that left and right. But now that they've been scattered, I mentioned this to you two years ago when we studied Isaiah chapter 40, when so-called second Isaiah begins, when we're back to poetry in the second half, and how merciful it is. Then instead of beginning with, I told you so, it begins with that beautiful note from Handel's Messiah, comfort ye my people. I've often said to my own students that before a sin, Jesus teaches justice and Satan teaches mercy. And after the sin, they switch. After the sin has been committed, after we didn't listen to the Lord's warnings about justice, he then reassures us with mercy. It's okay. It's not the end of the world. It, it's serious. I tried to warn you against that. But since you've succumbed, please allow me to offer you my reassuring redemption. Whereas the devil, totally opposite. Before the sin, it's all mercy. It's, oh, everybody's doing it, and you can always repent, and it's no big deal, and the bishop's a pushover, and you still got time before your mission, and all those things that he tells us. And it's only after the fact that he flips and starts teaching justice instead. Like, nope, it's over for you. You'll never be able to change. God can't look upon your sin with the least degree of allowance. Oh, the Lord only says that before the sin. Do you understand the difference? And so what, we're, what we've been studying, the reason I, put, I say that is this. So far with Isaiah chapter 48 and 49, and 50 and 51 and the beginning of 52, which we've all studied with the help of, of Nephi and Jacob, all of that is from the merciful half of Isaiah. It's post-scattering. And as a result, they need to be reassured that there is a gathering that has been guaranteed. Scoop you up in your arms, lift you up on the shoulders, bring you home with rejoicing. Who hath begotten me these? All those beautiful promises. That's all in the second merciful half. And Nephi taught that, that to us in 1 Nephi 20 and 21. Jacob teaches that to us in 2 Nephi 6, 7, and 8. Now we're rewinding the clock. And in some ways, Nephi, if this is the, the, the key elements of Isaiah he wants us to understand, then what he was giving us before is simply a reassurance before the fact. Helping us see the end from the beginning. It's going to be okay, but now let's get into the thick of it and realize what went wrong in the first place. And that's what Isaiah 2 through 14, the so-called Isaiah chapters, are really going to convey this week and next week. So you with me? I also want to point out the fact, because this is going to be the ultimate example of it. Like I said, Isaiah chapters are scattered throughout the book. And typically, the way it's organized is it will start with motivation, then go to quotation, and then end with explanation. Okay, those, that three, those three in order. Motivation, quotation, explanation. So that before he quotes Isaiah, he gives you a little pump-up speech. Okay? 
Remember how he did that? He's, he's going to quote Isaiah the first time in 1 Nephi 20 and 21. So how does he end chapter 19? With a little pump-up speech. You can do this. In fact, you're going to want to do this because Isaiah is meant to give you hope. So liken these things into yourself. I'm quoting Isaiah so that he can more fully persuade you to believe in the Messiah. Uh, there's a great pump-up speech. Then he quotes Isaiah for two chapters, and then he gives you 1 Nephi 22, which is his explanation of everything that came before. Okay? Now, Jacob did the same thing. In Jacob's case, his quotation is going to be 2 Nephi 6, 7, and 8. But at the beginning of chapter 6, what does he do? He gives you his little pump-up speech. The book of Isaiah is there to give you hope. Make sure that you are likening these things unto yourself, and you'll see its relevance to your own situation. So there's the, there's the motivation, the encouragement, then he the quotation, and then in 2 Nephi 9 and 10 is Jacob's explanation of what he just studied. Okay? You following the, the pattern? Well, the, the, the ultimate example of that pattern is what we'll see today and next week. Because it's the ultimate Isaiah chunk, right? And so it, while we see the 12 solid chapters of quotation, that's going to be Isaiah 2 through 14, or in our case, 2 Nephi 12 through 24, Nephi is going to give us an entire chapter of motivation to begin with, and then an entire chapter and then some of explanation when all is said and done. Okay? So 2 Nephi 11, where we'll start today, is going to be this, this pump-up speech, and it's a glorious one. Uh, it's, uh, in some ways, Nephi knows, okay, if I'm going to give him 12 solid chapters, I better give him a solid chapter of pump-up to get them through it. And then by the time you emerge bloodied and bruised on the other side of the, of the cha Isaiah chapters, he's there waiting for you, looking rather refreshed, actually, to try to help us make sense of what he just put us through, okay? With that, in fact, look at 2 Nephi chapter 11, verse 1, 2, and 3, and we'll see Nephi's original or initial pump-up uh, motivation, encouragement of why he's going to subject us to so much Isaiah. Chapter 11, verse 1, Now Jacob spake many more things to my people at that time. There's his pastoral perfectionism probably still going strong. There's him still magnifying his office and shaking the blood from his garments. So chapter 10, which was the second day's sermon, evidently extended a lot more than just that one chapter. Man, makes me salivate. Wish I had more. But that's all we've got. That's all Nephi is giving us. He says, Nevertheless, only these things have I caused to be written, for the things which I have written sufficeth me. It's important that we know how much is enough, right? Well, who am I to talk? But, but Nephi gets it and says, okay, Jacob loved the rest of your sermon, but for my latter day audience, enough is enough. And now I, Nephi, so now we're pivoting back to him, write more of the words of Isaiah, for my soul delighteth in his words. Okay? As far as I'm concerned, the greatest Isaiah scholar in history is none other than Nephi. And Nephi absolutely loves Isaiah. Isaiah lived and ministered, oh, a century and a half before Nephi did, which it makes it roughly the difference between us and Joseph Smith. And so for us to quote the prophet of the restoration, well, here's Nephi quoting the prophet of the scattering and gathering. And, and there's that same kind of, like, it's, it's, more, it's recent enough in Nephi's mind that he knows the history, he understands the historical context, he gets Isaiah's images and allusions, his symbolism. I, I, I love this guy. I, my soul delights in his words. And then he gives us this advice, for I will liken his words unto my people. It should strike us, by the way, that all three times that Isaiah has been quoted so far, so far likening has been part of the, the pattern in all three instances. We've got to learn to liken. Like I said last time, Isaiah will never be likable until he's likenable, and we see him speaking to our own situation. That's what Nephi is going to be doing here. It's not that he's playing fast and loose with Isaiah's words, but that he's recognizing there's resonance beyond its original context. And honestly, that's what Scripture is, something that outlives its origin and continues to be applicable to later audiences, if they'll liken them, that is. So Nephi, he's definitely going to. I will liken his words unto my people, and I will send them forth unto all my children. So it's not just that it's going to resonate in Nephi's day, it's going to resonate in later generations as well, okay? 
For he, and I was going to explain another reason why this is so relevant and why Nephi delights in these words. For he, Isaiah, verily saw my Redeemer, even as I have seen him. And my brother Jacob also has seen him as I have seen him. Wherefore, I will send these words forth unto my children to prove unto them that my words are true. Wherefore, by the words of three, God hath said, I will establish my word. Nevertheless, God sendeth more witnesses, and he proveth all his words. So a good Jewish invocation of the law of witnesses there. By the mouth of two or three shall every word be established. In the small plates of Nephi, who are the three who write the most? Nephi, our grand editor, when all is said and done. Jacob, who he calls upon to teach a big chunk, chunk that we saw last week. And Isaiah. And so to have those three witnesses, and we think of the restoration beginning with the testimony of the three witnesses. Well, the Book of Mormon itself begins with the testimony of its own three witnesses. And what binds them together? What, what do they have in common? That these are witnesses of none other than the Savior himself. They've seen him. They've rejoiced in his day. And talk about an amazing little group, this tiny little cloud of witnesses that can rejoice in their shared testimony of the Savior. Now, for us to understand a little bit more about what Nephi is doing, go back to that earliest phrase, my soul delighteth in his words. We saw some things that Nephi's soul delighted in in his glorious psalm of Nephi two weeks ago. But we're going to see more soul rejoicing in this chapter than anywhere else, because over and over and over he talks about the things that matter most to him. Right as he's about to quote Isaiah, and he also rejoices in Isaiah. Now let's do this by the law of association, okay? If A equals B and C equals B, then A must equal C as well. So let's put it in these terms. If Nephi delights in Isaiah, his soul, okay? Not just his mind, which is interesting. Uh, not just his, the, the intellectual, the logical, the rational, but soul that there's something emotional and something spiritual, something persuasive and powerful about the way Isaiah teaches. My soul rejoices in what he does. Then he'll go on, and my soul rejoices in all these things as well. Now connect the dots. If, if, if I rejoice in Isaiah and I rejoice in these other things, then chances are Isaiah must rejoice in those things too. That's why Nephi wants to keep quoting him. They share a similar heart. They share a singular soul. And the things that they rejoice in together are the things they need us to rejoice in as well. So pay attention to the list. Because again, as I've pointed out earlier, what an interesting irony that Nephi, Mr. I glory in plainness, would also glory in Isaiah that didn't glory in plainness at all. <laughs> Isaiah gloried in, in all kinds of things, but clarity, eh, that was low on the totem pole. In fact, how's this for a chart to put these two mission companions side by side? If you have Nephi on one side and Isaiah on the other, Nephi already said, I glory in plainness. And he also already said, I turn to Isaiah when I need persuasive power. There's something about Isaiah's approach that can persuade us. I'm giving the instruction manual. It definitely explains how to do things, but I don't know if anybody's going to want to if that's all they read. It doesn't, oh, breathe life into things. It's just an instruction manual. Whereas Isaiah, oh, he persuades, at least once you understand him. For that then, how about this difference? Nephi is the one who's writing in prose, while Isaiah is the one writing in poetry. And yeah, I've never seen an instruction book composed as a Shakespearean sonnet, <laughs> right? It's too confusing. But man, once you understand the Shakespearean sonnet, it moves us in ways that mere prose cannot. Another example, the difference between them, Nephi seems to aim for the head, and Isaiah aims for the heart. And again, that's too stark. There's an overlap. There's a Venn diagram here. But there's enough of a difference that I love this mission companionship. If you had mission companions that were enough alike 
uh, or enough like you that you rejoiced in the same things, but then had different approaches to convey the things in with which you or in which you rejoiced. What an amazing combination. What a dynamic duo. If one was a lifelong member and the other was a convert, for example, uh, if one was from one part of the world and the other from another, and you just related to your investigators in different ways, they drew different gifts out of you. That's what's happening with Nephi and Isaiah here. Uh, and I, I glory in them both because they help me glory in the things they glory in. Speaking of which, let's see what those are. Verse 4 and 5, Behold, my soul, and by extension, Isaiah's soul also, delighteth in proving unto my people the truth of the coming of Christ. For for this end hath the law of Moses been given, and all things which have been given by God from the beginning of the world unto man are the typifying of him. Think about that. The law, everything else from creation on down, it's all foreshadowing. It's all prophetic. It's all pointing to the coming of Christ. And I want to prove that to people with Isaiah's help. He goes on, Also my soul delighteth in the covenants of the Lord, which he hath made to our fathers. And that, has, that, that word covenants has run throughout the Book of Mormon from start to finish. Uh, it's on the title page. That's one of the major purposes of this entire book. And since Nephi's soul delights in it, he's going to invoke one of the most covenantal prophets of the Old Testament, namely Isaiah. What else do they rejoice in? Yea, my soul delighteth in his, that is the Lord's, grace, and in his justice, and power, and mercy, in the great and eternal plan of deliverance from death. There we see Nephi learning something from his little brother, where Jacob had given all of those wonderful O's. Oh, the great plan of our God, the plan of deliverance from death. Nephi is now using similar language and rejoicing in similar attributes, justice and mercy, power and grace. There's some interesting contraries there, and God proves them perfectly. And Nephi rejoices in that fact. In some ways, the fact that Jacob, like we talked about last week, could weave together Old Testament gathering of Israel with New Testament gathering to God, that we could see scattering and gathering right alongside crucifixion and resurrection, uh, couple it with what Nephi saw in his visions with apostasy and restoration. All these, these, du these dualisms coming together. Uh, Jacob did it, Nephi did it master masterfully in 1 Nephi 22. Jacob did it masterfully in 2 Nephi 9 and 10. Nephi is going to do it masterfully in 2 Nephi 25 through 30. Uh, we, it's amazing what's happening as these two halves are becoming a whole. And Nephi glories, his, his soul delights in the whole process. Verse 6 and 7, here's some more delighting. My soul delighteth in proving unto my people. He already talked about proving that Christ would come, but here's why that proof is so essential. Proving unto my people that save Christ should come, all men must perish. Lehi taught that in 2 Nephi 2. Jacob taught that in 2 Nephi 9. Nephi is giving a third witness of that already. For if there be no Christ, he says, there be no God. And if there be no God, we are not, for there could have been no creation. But there is a God, and he is Christ, and he cometh in the fullness of his own time. Yes, for Nephi, it all comes back to Christ. He wants to prove, he wants to confirm that without him, there's nothing. And so when all of this is said and done in his final words at the end of 2 Nephi, it all culminates in Christ. The, 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 all of this is meant to prepare us for and prove us or prove to us that Jesus is the Christ, right? There's a, a purpose for the Book of Mormon on the title page as well. Well, verse 8, now I write some of the words of Isaiah. Have we had enough uh, encouragement to this point? That whoso of my people shall see these words may lift up their hearts and rejoice. And not just for themselves. Rejoice for all men. We're, we saw that in 1 Nephi 19. We saw it in 2 Nephi 6. Isaiah is meant to bring us rejoicing. 
not, it's not, it's not supposed to devastate it. It's not supposed to be this barrier that we can't get past. No, it's meant to give us hope, to lift up our hearts, to give us cause for rejoicing because we know that the cause of Christ will come to its glorious fulfillment. He's going to come in all of his glory and justice and mercy and power and grace. It's in his hands. This is his glorious plan. So rejoice in it. And so ready to send us forth into what seems like an impenetrable jungle of Isaiah passages. He then says, now these are the words and ye may liken them unto you and unto all men. So again, a reminder of the need to liken and a reminder that this is not just for Nephi's audience. It's not just for his children's sake, but it's for all humanity. We, even in our day, are meant to rejoice over these words. That We're meant to liken them to our situation. And we'll be doing plenty of that for the next few weeks. But here's something I want us to understand before we dig in. Uh, and we'll do this again next week when we get to chapter 25. But I want to give you at least a preview of that to give us some help for what we're about to try to accomplish. Because in 2 Nephi 25, like I said, Nephi's there waiting for us. It's like he's already cleaned up and showered and he's looking great. And we are, are just, we got, we got pieces of, of, of tree in our hair and, and we're wrapped with vines around our ankles and we're scratched and bloodied and we're kind of crawling our way out of the, of the, the jungle uh, into the clearing beyond. And Nephi looks down and smiles and says, Ooh, that was a little harder for you than you thought it would be, wasn't it? And we look up and roll our eyes and go, yeah, thanks a lot. I mean, I, you gave me enough of a pump-up speech in chapter 11 that I was excited for this. But chapter after chapter after chapter, I started losing my momentum. Because Isaiah is hard for me. He was only 150 years away from you. He was 2,600, 27, excuse me, 2,700 years away from us. And I had to get pushed through 17th century King James English. And yeah, I'm confused. Okay, forgive me. And he's like, oh, no, no, no forgiveness needed. Uh, I, I get it. I understand how hard it is. Let's just give you some insights on how you can make more sense of this. And that's what he does in chapter 25. Again, there's a part of me that wishes he would have done it in chapter 11, along with his pump-up speech. That's why I'm going to do it that way here. Okay, so uh, though it's going to steal some thunder from next week's lesson, so be it. Run with me real quick, fast field trip to chapter 25. And here are five keys to understand Isaiah that Nephi himself gives us. The greatest Isaiah scholar of all time in my book. Chapter 25, verse 1. Here's the first one. The manner of prophesying among the Jews. That would have really been helpful <laughs> if you would have known how do Jews prophesy? What is, what is it about Hebrew poetry that I need to know to be able to make sense of Isaiah's writing style? Because, yeah, poetry is different from prose. It's like I'm going to read a certain genre differently than a different genre. So what is the manner of Jewish prophecy? Second one comes in verse 4, where Nephi speaks of being filled with the spirit of prophecy. So that would help us. And prophecy, on the one hand, being speaking to future days, that's a beautiful part of it. But also, as the book of Revelation tells us, the spirit, of Reve uh, the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. So let's keep an eye out for Jesus here, okay? And we're going to see some evidences and hints of him in what we see this week as well as in next. So be filled with that, pro with that spirit of prophecy. Third key shows up in verse 5, where the things of the Jews are mentioned. And by things of the Jews, we can just, yeah, Jewish stuff. Isaiah is going to use plants and animals and harvesting practices and a bunch of objects that were normal in his day, but unfortunately we don't use anymore in ours. I'll put it this way. These are the objects of Isaiah's object lessons. Uh, he is so, so masterful a poet that he draws in all kinds of interesting imagery. But to do it, he draws upon things that his initial audience would have understood. So we might need some help understanding Jewish stuff. Okay. The next key shows up in verse 6, where Nephi mentions the regions round about Jerusalem and the judgments of God which have come to pass among the Jews. By that, we could simply label it Jewish geography and history. And that's helpful to understand also. When we talk about north and south in American history, 
Ah, well, if you know civil war, then that geography makes sense to us. In Isaiah's day, do we understand what he means by things coming from the north and from the east? Do we understand enough history to make sense of the Assyrian invasion and the scattering of the northern tribes, the Babylonian invasion and the captivity of the Jews as they're brought back to Babylonian exile? We've got to know enough of Jewish history to make sense of what Isaiah is going through in his day and the immediate future that he's prophesying of. Okay? And then the fifth, and this one comes most naturally to us, thank heavens. At least we get one that comes easily. This shows up in verse 7 and 8 where Nephi says, In the days that the prophecies of Isaiah shall be fulfilled, men shall know of a surety at the times when they shall come to pass. And then later he says, They shall be of great worth unto them in the last days. For in that day shall they understand them. It's like, hallelujah. Okay, someday. Then again, if those are our days, are we standing in the way of that prophecy? We're the ones that are supposed to understand them better than anyone. Now, like I said, we have a leg up on the competition because we're seeing them fulfilled all around us. We are living in the days of their fulfillment. And so to look back and read that and go, oh, yeah, I, not only am I seeing that on the pages of Isaiah, I'm seeing that on the nightly news. Uh, and, and that can be a very helpful uh, a benefit on our side. Like I said, it comes naturally. But to understand the rest, and yes, in our day we better, then I would say, A, pray for the spirit of prophecy. Pray to have the testimony of Jesus oh, front and center as you study. And then when it comes to understanding geography and history and Jewish stuff, some good commentaries would, would come in handy. Now, to look at Isaiah commentaries, to be able to search online some of the things that are mentioned. You don't have to turn to, uh, to today's scholars or academic scholars for theology, but for history, they're really good. Okay, And so to understand what Isaiah means by some of the things he's saying, that can really come in handy. And then the other one, the first one that he mentions about knowing the manner of prophesying among the Jews, that can make a huge difference as well. In my own classes, I typically spend a whole day just trying to explain to my students the manner of prophesying among the Jews, namely the form of Hebrew poetry. And I'll walk them through rhyme schemes in John Milton uh, and in Henry Wadsworth, uh, Wordsworth Longfellow, uh, and then Isaiah. We'll go from great, great, uh, great English poet to great American poet to the greatest of all Hebrew poets and try to understand what rhyme scheme is all about. It's kind of fun to take a, a poem in English and then take it out of its poetic lines and force it to just take a paragraph form. I'll always put that up on the, on the screen and ask my students, does this look like a poet, a poem? And they're like, no, it looks like a paragraph. Ah, so what, what's our first step? Well, let's put it into its poetic lines. Nice, once you've done that, can you start to see the rhyme scheme? the A, B, A, B, or the A, A, B, B, and, and just the way it works its way through. Uh, I've shown them, that's one of the reasons I love Milton, because some of his poems, yes, are in rhyme, but the rhyme scheme is so complex, you, you barely even know that he's rhyming until you actually see it spelled out. It's fascinating. Well, when you get to Isaiah as the grand finale of this exercise, A, in our... King James Version of the Old Testament, as well as in our Book of Mormon, they're just written as paragraphs instead of poetic lines. That makes things harder from the start. And yes, there are online resources where you can see Isaiah in its poetic lines. It clarifies things beautifully. Then the next step is then let's figure out the rhyme scheme. Is this an AABB or is this an ABAB? How does it work? And this is where it gets even more fun. Because I'll ask, I'll put up some Isaiah and ask my students, does this rhyme? And they'll look at it and go, no. It's like, oh, so is it free verse? Because you can have poetry that doesn't rhyme. And then typically in every class, there'll be a, an ultra intelligent student that says, wait, 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 wait. We're, we're looking at this in translation. So unless they're trying, I mean, it could have rhymed in the original Hebrew and not rhyme in some English translation that's just trying to be word by word exact. It's a great point. I'm always amazed that in the hymn book, they can translate songs that were written in English originally 
into Spanish or Portuguese or French or, or anything else and still make them rhyme. That's some impressive translation skills. So, I, and so it's like, I guess the King James translators lacked those skills, didn't they? And then it's actually no. That's one of the great gifts of the King James translation. Uh, what if it's, it's more Isaiah than Nephi. It may, be, it may not glory in plainness, but it does glory in power and poetry and persuasion. That's the majesty of that language. But here's where it gets interesting. Okay, I understand where you're coming from. You're right. It's not going to rhyme in the same way in English. But guess what? It does rhyme in Hebrew. So you were right about that. Original, the way uh, Isaiah spells it out, it does rhyme. But brace yourself for this. It still rhymes in English. And they always scour, start you know, scouring the page looking for rhyming words. And like, I'm not seeing it. I said, well, look harder because it rhymes in English. In fact, it rhymes in Spanish. It rhymes in Portuguese. It rhymes in French. It rhymes in Chinese. In fact, it rhymes in American Sign Language. And that really throws the students for a loop. They're like, what are you talking about? Rhyming in sign language? I said, yeah. That's the miracle of Hebrew poetry. It rhymes in every language. Regardless of translation, it's going to rhyme. Because they're not rhyming sounds. They're rhyming ideas. You see, in English, we think of a rhyme, a rhyming poem, as the sound of the end of the word. And as long as it's rhyming, then we're keeping its timing. And you understand what I'm, what I'm saying here? Whereas for an ancient Hebrew poet like Isaiah, ah, the sound doesn't matter. It's the thought. It's the concept. And so I'm going to say something, and then I'll say it again with a different image. Then I'll say something new and then repeat that idea using different kinds of metaphors or language hoping at least one of them sticks. I actually had one student say, wait a minute. So I don't have to know 66 chapters of Isaiah. I only have to understand 33, and then the other half will make sense. I said, well, I like your math there. Close, but not quite. But there is value in looking for these, these couplets and see it and then see it again in different terms. And sometimes if you don't understand one of the halves of the couplet, but you do understand the other, ah, that's the key to unlocking the part you didn't get. Now, sometimes it's called, it's called parallelism. So we're having these parallel thoughts. And sometimes that parallelism is synonymous. Okay, so same idea repeated twice. That's called, you guessed it, synonymous parallelism. Other times it's the opposite. They call that antithetical parallelism, where they'll say one thing and then he'll say the opposite to bring out that contrast. There's other times where Isaiah will say something and say it again more intensely and say it still again even more intensely than that. Kind of a crescendo so that the final one is the, the, the symbol crash. Now are you understanding what I'm trying to convey? And other times it's a decrescendo. Well, he'll say it's strongest the first time and then ease off and then ease off even more. And so kind of the, the, the echo that's starting to disappear in the distance. He will mount up with wings as eagles. Let me say it again softer. He will run and not be weary. Let me say it even softer. He will walk and not faint. You get this? Uh, the masterpiece of them all, by the way, is chiasmus, where it's a massive rhyme scheme, but the first thing, the first idea rhymes with the last idea, and the second idea rhymes with the second to last idea, and on and on and on, as many lines as you want to make it, with the central rhyme, the couplet that's right one after the other, being the key of the entire passage. Some have asked me, why would Isaiah do all this? And well, because he could. And in some ways, when you see a Moroni complaining, I can't write well enough to do justice to my subject matter. Isaiah didn't have that problem. Isaiah, Isaiah is the Old, Testament's, Old Testament equivalent of Nele Maxwell. And Elder Maxwell, oh, pull out the dictionary, pull out the thesaurus. It will be worth it once you understand what he's saying. Same with Isaiah. Okay? So with all of that background, are you ready to go back to chapter 12 and really dig in? Have you had enough of a, a pump-up speech? Enough of a preliminary explanation of some things that will help us make sense of this? In Tennessee, once we were going to do a, a 5K uh, for the young single adults. They actually called it the Isaiah 5K because they were hoping people would run and not be weary. <laughs> How's that for appropriate for this week's material? 
But our stake president at the time, wonderful man, is a, is a triathlete, an iron man, among iron men. And he gave us a little fireside uh, before the 5K began. And it was a beautiful pump up speech. Now, it was all these young single adults. And then me, as their institute director, I joined with them. And man, when we first took off, we all took off fast, including me. The further we went, <laughs> the further behind I fell. And yes, thankfully I finished, but I joked with the stake president afterwards and said, you know what, after your pump up speech, I was ready to go run a marathon. I was ready to sign up for the Iron Man right alongside you. Well, about halfway through this, this uh, 5K, I could have used another pump up speech. No, but at least I made it. And in some ways, maybe that's why we're breaking up the Isaiah chapters over two weeks. Maybe we'll need a, a second pump up speech as we start again next week with chapter 20. But for today, from Isaiah 2 through Isaiah 9, so 2 Nephi 12 through 19, that's the chunk of Isaiah that will, that will captivate us. Now, in the original Book of Mormon, before Orson Pratt came to further divide things up into smaller chapters and verses, the original Book of Mormon had chapter breaks as well, and they were put there by Nephi, okay? At least in First and Second Nephi, that is. And in this one, we have some interesting breaks when it comes to the Isaiah chapters. The original chapter 8 of 2 Nephi was what we see in, in 2 Nephi 11 through 15. We're going to cover all of that today. The original chapter 9 of 2 Nephi covered 2 Nephi 16 through 22. That's Isaiah 6 through 12. We're going to cover the first half of that today, and then we'll have the second half of it next week. And then the original chapter 10 of 2 Nephi is what we have today in 2 Nephi 23 and 24. Just two chapters, but that's Isaiah 13 and 14. And yes, it is a different, a different animal that Isaiah wants us to wrestle with there and that Nephi wants us to wrestle with. And so we are seeing three different sections of Isaiah over the next two weeks. And if you wanted to see them in, oh, in bright contrast of what is each section of Isaiah trying to accomplish, what's Nephi's goal with each of his three chapters of Isaiah, well, the first one is going to demonstrate just how far Israel has fallen. It's going to paint the picture of its wickedness and its impending captivity. Bad news, we'll see as we start. Then the second chapter uh, that is going to straddle this week and the beginning of next week is God reducing Israel down to a righteous remnant. Uh, we're going to start to see that today, and it's pretty fascinating. Because of their wickedness, because of their impending destruction, first part, they will be reduced to a remnant, but that remnant will be a righteous one. You can start over with this group, which is exactly what God intends. Because in the third section of Isaiah, the third chapter that Nephi gives us, that is going to be the good news of Israel finally triumphing over all her enemies. That righteous remnant has returned. The scattered uh, Israel has returned and been gathered home again. So glorious things to look forward to. Uh, with that in mind, let's get into the text itself. And like I said, chapter 12 of 2 Nephi, namely Isaiah chapter 2, is going to begin painting the picture of how did Israel find itself in this horrible mess. And yet, notice its beginning. 2 Nephi 12 verse 1 the word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. There's his immediate audience. It shall come to pass in the last days. So, okay, he's speaking to his time period, but he's speaking of our time period. In the last days, when the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains, and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it, and many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us of his ways. We will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Now, I thought I just said that this was the bad news. Well, it will be, just a second. But I love the fact that Isaiah gives us the end from the beginning. He shows us what the ultimate goal is and what the ultimate result will be. That's where we'll be in the last days. 
No, we're in the first days as far as Isaiah is concerned. And so, yeah, there's a lot of mess we're going to have to navigate on the way. But keep the end in mind because it is glorious. In some ways, to think about what Nephi does shortly after quoting his first chunk of Isaiah and right before asking Jacob to quote the second chunk of Isaiah, What's he doing in 2 Nephi 5? He builds a temple. He builds a mountain of the Lord. As if to say, this is the goal. And all that we're doing as we try to live after the manner of happiness is to get us back into God's ultimate presence. And the temple is a preview of coming attractions, coming exaltations, as far as that is concerned. Now, I won't do this moving forward, at least not very often, because it will, it will slow us down unnecessarily. But take a moment and savor the rhyme scheme of what we're starting to see here. Now, it's going to be in the last days and the mountain of the Lord's house is established. That's kind of introductory. But then how's this for couplets? Synonymous parallelism. It shall be established in the top of the mountains. Let me say that again a little differently. It shall be exalted above the hills. Next idea. All nations shall flow unto it. Let me repeat that. And many people shall go. Now, flowing unto it, by the way, if it's on the mountain, it's flowing uphill. That's interesting. These are not people that are taking the path of least resistance. They're not flowing downhill. No, they're flowing against. This is up. The river itself is flowing upstream. That's wild. It is bringing us up. There's some kind of pull stronger than the force of gravity. The house of God that just wills us to come up to its higher and holier level of living. And we're going to come. We're going to go. And this is what we'll say. Come ye. Let me say that again. Let us go up. Where are we headed? Well, to the mountain of the Lord. Let me say that again. To the house of the God of Jacob. That's really where parallel lines can be helpful. Because when if you, were, if you were to ask somebody, what's the mountain of the Lord? They might say, uh, Sinai, uh, Hermon, T uh, Tabor. There's all kinds of mountains mentioned in Scripture. Well, thanks to Isaiah's couplet, what is the mountain of the Lord? Ah, it's the house of the God of Jacob. What will happen there? Well, first idea, he will teach us his ways and then repeat, as a result, we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and then let me repeat that, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. We get in a sense there of the couplets as they come. You'll see more of them clearly in verse 4, as this again continues the preview of coming exaltations. He shall judge among the nations. Let me say it again. He shall rebuke many people. And as a result of that divine judgment, they shall beat their swords into plowshares. And then another visual image saying the same thing. And their spears into pruning hooks. As a result of that, nation shall not lift up sword against nation. And then, here's the rhyme, neither shall they learn war anymore. We're about to see in this and subsequent chapters that war was a continuous problem among the ancient Israelites. Go back and reread the Old Testament. It's everywhere. And what a dream, what a gift, what a miracle to eventually, someday, live in a period of peace. For us living in the last days, we would see this as the millennial reign. And there's going to be hints of that dropped in chapter 21, for example, of 2 Nephi. That's Isaiah chapter 11. Lions and lambs lying down together. There's some beautiful truth there. But to picture those who have been using implements of war, swords and spears, and living in a period of peace where all of a sudden it's like, what do, what do we even use those things for? We've got to repurpose our weapons so that they can have some kind of usefulness. And they think, oh, well, you know, a sword is kind of like a, a plow. Once you just kind of pierce the earth and then drag it along, it will uproot things. And a spear, oh, that's just a pruning hook. Where I can, it's long, so I can get it and get the sharp part and, and prune some of the upper branches of my tree. Ah, that's, that's better use for it. 
Imagine taking nuclear technology, for example, and instead of turning it to weaponry, we turn it to energy production. Uh, imagine that. To be in a time period where there's a better purpose for the things that we've been using against each other. Now we can use them to help one another. We can grow food and feed the hungry all around us. Okay? The aftermath of war is typically famine. It's typically poverty and want and suffering and sorrow. And so to change all of that, that's the end from the beginning. That's where we're trying to go. So from here on out, through these Isaiah chapters, anytime you either get lost in confusing, confusing language, or even worse, you get lost in a hopelessness as you see wickedness all around you, then rush back to the very beginning of what Nephi quotes. Which again, if it was 3rd Isaiah that tacked on chapter 1, this is the beginning of what Nephi is writing in his book. It's the mountain of the Lord. It's temple blessings. It's being back in his presence. And the place of peace now becomes an epicenter of peace that spreads across the whole world. What a goal. But to get there, verse 5, O house of Jacob, Come ye, and let us walk in the light of the Lord. Yea, come, for ye have all gone astray, every one to his wicked ways. By the way, Nephi couldn't help himself there. I know he's supposed to be sticking with the beginning of Isaiah, but he had to rush to the end and just bring in one more phrase. The end of that verse is not in Isaiah chapter 2. It's only in 2 Nephi chapter 12. But when it says, ye have all gone astray, every one to his wicked ways, that's actually an allusion to Isaiah 53, the great suffering servant song. And all we like sheep have gone astray. We've all wandered in our own wicked ways. So it's, yeah, a little bit of the, the, the mercy chapters, got to squeeze it here in the justice chapters. Nephi can't help himself. But that's what we're up against. What's, the problem is earthly gravity, the weight of our own wickedness. And instead of flowing up to the mountain of the Lord, we are falling down into our own wicked ways. Come on, let's walk in the light of the Lord. We've got to be better than we are. But they're not ready to change. What do they need to repent of? Keep an eye on this, starting in verse 6. Therefore, O Lord, thou hast forsaken thy people, the house of Jacob. And remember, all that stuff we saw last week, it's not that God has forsaken them, it's that they've forsaken him. They're just feeling forsaken as a result. How could you divorce my mom? How could you sell me to your creditors? All that kind of language we saw later in Isaiah. Here, though, this feeling of being forsaken, here's why. Here's what you've done to forsake me. Because they be replenished from the east, that's outside of Israel. Let me repeat that again, different imagery. They hearken unto soothsayers like the Philistines. They're more on the west side. And then I'll repeat this even a third time for emphasis. They please themselves in the children of strangers. You see the common threads? The east outside of Israel. The Philistines outside of Israel. Strangers outside of Israel. You are succumbing to outside influences. You're refusing to be my peculiar people. You want to fit in like everybody else, and that's not good, because notice where it leaves you. Their land also is full of silver and gold. Let me repeat that. Neither is there any end of their treasures. So now we're seeing an overemphasis on economics. This is, this is greed and gold and wanting to be as rich as all the surrounding empires. Next problem. Their land is also full of horses. Let me repeat that. Neither is there any end of their chariots. So not only are they trusting in the arm of flesh as far as oh, temporal gain, but they're trusting in the arm of flesh as far as military might. What else are you using horses and chariots for, my friends, other than to have a military advantage as you take on surrounding kingdoms, trying to rob them of their gold and silver, trying to get more treasure than they have. It's not just that I want to fit in among the other nations. I want to be superior to them. Beat them at their own game, even though that's not a game we were ever called upon to play. Because part of the problem, those outside influences, keep reading, their land is also full of idols. Repeat it. They worship the work of their own hands. Repeat it. That which their own fingers have made. 
Oh, here at the start, Isaiah is being ultra emphatic, using triplets instead of just couplets, wanting to make sure they understand what is going wrong here. Trusting in false gods instead of the God of Israel? Seeking military might instead of spiritual strength? Seeking economic gain instead of spiritual gain? They're, they are climbing the ladder, but it's leaning against the wrong wall. And sure enough, those are all things we struggle with today. As we're trying to liken these things to ourselves, am I seeking the gods of gold or the God of Israel? Am I trying to fit in with everyone else or am I playing a different game, the Lord's game, seeking holiness instead of mere worldliness? What direction am I headed? Uphill or down? Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. Do I want life or death, blessings or curses? Choice is mine. And what do all of those problems stem from? A single sin. Look at verse 9. The mean man boweth not down. The great man humbleth himself not. Did you hear the rhyme there? Therefore, forgive him not. In fact, I can't forgive because you haven't repented. And why won't you repent? Because you don't think you have anything to repent of. That is pride speaking. And the problem of pride, as President Benson warned us, is a universal sin. No wonder they struggled with it then. No wonder we still struggle with it today. Our false gods, our idols are made of different things. But as President Kimball so beautifully taught us a generation ago, there are still false gods we worship even today. It's our pride that's doing it to us. For the next few verses then, Isaiah will just pepper us with images of pride to try to paint that picture of what we're becoming as all of this is going to our heads. The warning here, by the way, is, is that lofty looks will be brought down. The, pride, the, proud, the proud will be taken down a notch or two or 20. So prepare yourself for that. The way he says it in verse 11, the lofty looks of man shall be humbled. Or verse 12, the day of the Lord of hosts soon cometh upon all nations, yea, upon every one, yea, upon the proud and lofty. And then how's this for visual images? Verse 13, upon all the cedars of Lebanon, upon all the oaks of Bashan. And those are proud trees. I mean, if you're going to use the cedars of Lebanon to build the temple with, because nothing else is good enough? Well, I guess that went to the head of the trees themselves. And so, I'm a cedar of Lebanon. Or if you're in Bashan, oh, I'm an oak, a mighty oak. Or verse 14, it's upon all the high mountains, upon all the hills. And we're not talking mountain of the Lord here. No, these are, these are alternate mountaintops. High and mighty, above, looking down at the valleys beneath them. How about 15? It'll come upon every high tower. Upon every fenced wall, these false sources of strength. Or verse 16, it'll come upon all the ships of the sea. Let's extend that. Upon all the ships of Tarshish, which is modern-day Spain, as far as... This is, that's the edge of the known world. But even that's not far enough. Let's take it one step further. Upon all pleasant pictures. I mean, places we uh, will never get to, but we're just going to paint pictures of it. Oh, one of those foreign, one of, the, one of those postcards from a foreign land. Wish you were here. Well, nobody's going to wish they were there because it's all those kinds of places that will be toppled, that will be brought low. It is all about role reversal. God exalts the lowly, but he brings down the lofty. And the pride of the world will be leveled by a God who deserves to be alone in that superiority. The God of Israel is the one we worship. Now, what's going to happen to all of those who have thus been lowered? Verse 19, they shall go into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth. For the fear of the Lord shall come upon them and the glory of his majesty shall smite them when he ariseth to shake terribly the earth. Are they trying to avoid the consequences of their sins? Are they looking for mountains and caves to hide in? If you go back to Jeremiah 16, 16, a great prophecy of the gathering of Israel, 
It's where the Lord says that he will send for many fishers to fish them and many hunters to hunt them. But you remember where the hunters will go? To every mountain and every hill and the holes of the rocks. How's that for Jeremiah's rhyme scheme? Here's where we see them go into those places. Jeremiah will make sure that people go in after them to teach them and coax them back out. And all of this, by way of conclusion, verse 22, Cease ye from man whose breath is in his nostrils, for wherein is he to be accounted of? And I actually chuckle at that one. Isaiah is basically saying to conclude this chapter, why are you so enamored with mere mortals? Why do you want to fit in with everyone else when everyone else is nobody else? They're, they're nothing. And so to, to try to keep up with the Joneses when the Joneses just don't matter. No offense to any Joneses out there. You understand? Their breath is in their nostrils. I mean, come on now. I, I, the reason I laugh is King Benjamin, for example, will make a bit of a joke in this. Not a, well, not a joke for, for Benjamin. It seems to be a joke for Isaiah. For Benjamin, he says, we're nothing. He's trying to get us to be humble so we recognize our reliance on the Lord, right? And so one of the things he says about us um, unprofitable servants is that God lends us breath. Remember that phrase from King Benjamin's address? It's a, it's a doozy because what he's saying is even the air in your lungs is on loan. He didn't give you breath. You certainly didn't didn't go and claim it for yourself. Nope, it's just on loan. And if you don't believe me, I dare you. Try to hold on to it. Oh, please be my guest. Stand there and, and hold your breath. Refuse to give it back. It's like, oh no, this oxygen is all mine. And see how long that lasts for you. Before you have to breathe a new breath. A new, you have to take out a new loan because the interest has come due on your old one. You can't hold on to it. Try as you might. The worst that could happen is that you drop unconscious. But then what's the first thing that's, that's going to happen then? You'll exhale and God's like, okay, loan repaid. No, even the air we breathe is on loan from an almighty creator. And if that's the serious reality King Benjamin is conveying. The more humorous version is Isaiah laughing at the holes in our face known as nostrils. That's where you hold the air? It, you can't even close it. it. Really? I mean, if you think about that, it's like a balloon that you blow up and then you don't tie the knot at the bottom. We fill our lungs, but we don't, we don't plug our nose to keep it in there. No, nope, it just flows in and out and in and out, out every time. And Isaiah just can't help but laugh at the human condition that you can't tie your lungs shut. You can't close your nostrils. You have holes in your face. Man, humans, we're nothing. Why do we think we're everything? It's such a powerful lesson on humility. And Israel, ancient and modern, needs it. From there, he goes to chapter 3 of Isaiah, or in Nephi's case, chapter 13. And let's keep painting this picture, shall we? Well, we're on, we're on a roll, so let's keep echoing things. He's going to continue I, warning Judah here of the destruction that awaits them if they don't repent. You will be cut down like a cedar of Lebanon. You will be leveled to the earth like an oak of Bashan. And the way he puts it here, verse 1, For behold, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, doth take away from Jerusalem and from Judah the stay and the staff. What do you mean by that? Well, look for the rhyme. The whole staff of bread and the whole stay of water. Now, this is starting to sound like a city under siege. I got nothing to live on. Uh, where's the bread going to come from? I can't go out into the fields to harvest grain. Where's the water going to come from? I don't have any water source. Well, if the Lord takes away all of that, not only is he taking away what you're living on, it's he's taking away who is leading that life to begin with. Who are you going to follow? 
Because, as Isaiah says, the mighty man and the man of war, the judge and the prophet and the prudent and the ancient, the captain of fifty, the honorable man, the counselor, the cunning artificer, the eloquent orator, I mean, they're all gone too. From top to bottom, you've, you've got no one out there leading you in righteousness. What are you left with instead? Notice the next phrase. I will give children unto them to be their princes and babes shall rule over them. Talk about a loss of leadership. Who's in charge now? Oh, the inexperienced, the woefully immature and unprepared. I don't want to follow anyone like that. Well, that's all you've got. Verse 5, the people shall be oppressed, everyone by another and everyone by his neighbor. So it's not just outside forces coming in laying siege. We're, cut, we, we're enough of a danger to ourselves that we don't even have to turn to outside enemies. We're our own enemy. I don't love my neighbor. I'm not my brother's keeper. I'm oppressing those around me. The way he says it in the next line, the child shall behave himself proudly against the ancient and the base against the honorable. Society has completely lost its sense of deference, of respect. Everyone's just taking advantage of one another. Any chance they can. To the point that verse 6 says that when a man shall take hold of his brother, of the house of his father, and shall say, Thou hast clothing, be thou our ruler, and let not this ruin come under thy hand. We talk about meager qualifications. That's it? You've got clothes to wear? You can be in charge? Now, remember, to clothe something is to cover something. And in Hebrew, to cover means to atone. Picture Adam and Eve running around with coats of skin. Actually, not just Adam and Eve. Picture everyone running around with fig leaves. That's all they got. And somebody has a coat of skins. Whoa, where'd you get that? Among a bunch of uncovered, unatoned for, prideful individuals that refuse to repent. Oh, someone out there has clothing? Will you lead us, please? Well, keep reading. In that day shall he swear, saying, I will not be a healer. And notice, healing is what they're after. These are people who are sick, who are wounded. They need all the help and healing they can get. But this person they're trying to elevate? No, I, I'm not your healer. I can't do that. For in my house there is neither bread nor clothing. You get that? There's no bread of life. That stay, that staff has been forgotten. There are no robes of righteousness. I mean, you got somebody there that barely has enough to cover his own nakedness, and they're trying to elevate him to the throne. And no, I, I don't have anything to cover the rest of you in. So they're, they're, they're denying that. Make me not a ruler of the people, they say. And why would I want to rule over this people when there's nothing to rule over to begin with? For Jerusalem is ruined, and Judah is fallen, because their tongues and their doings have been against the Lord to provoke the eyes of his glory. You get a sense there why nobody wants to lead? Why would I want to be the captain of a sinking ship? Especially when it's all the people on board that have been poking holes in the hole instead of coming unto the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to be saved. We've done this to ourselves. And Isaiah is trying to warn his countrymen, his contemporaries, of what they've become and what will become of them as a result. He says in verse 9, The show of their countenance doth witness against them. And if it's the show of their countenance, he's basically saying there, you've got guilt written right on your face. There's no denying it. It doth declare their sin to be even as Sodom. And how's that for a scary foreshadowing? Because we know what became of Sodom once judgment came. Well, they cannot hide it. Again, it's on, plain as the nose on their face. It's on the show of their countenance. Woe unto their souls, Isaiah says. For they have rewarded evil unto themselves. Now, granted, that doesn't include everyone. There will always be righteous among the wicked, and Isaiah seems to recognize that in the next line. 
Say unto the righteous that it is well with them, for they shall eat the fruit of their doings. But the other side, Woe unto the wicked, for they shall perish, for the reward of their hands shall be upon them. So either way, it's the law of the harvest. You reap what you sow. The righteous will eat the fruit of their righteousness. Maybe there is still some bread of life out there, some living water to access. There is some clothing in the robes of Christ's righteousness. But for the wicked, oh no. There's the stay and the staff, the the nakedness before the all-seeing eye of God. All those things Jacob warned us about back in chapter 9. Here we're being punished, and punished by our sins, not for them. Now from there, keep reading, and there's another less obvious sin here. He actually hinted at it, at it when he said Sodom, and not the kind of sin that usually rushes to our mind when we think of Sodom. This is a more, uh, a less obvious one, but it's one that Ezekiel warned them about, uh, or he will later in history. Here, verse 14 and 15, the Lord will enter into judgment with the ancients of his people and the princes thereof, the people who think they're in charge, that have kind of led Israel into this mess. For ye have eaten up the vineyard and the spoil of the poor in your houses. What mean ye? So what are you thinking, Isaiah is asking? Ye beat my people to pieces and grind the faces of the poor, saith the Lord of hosts. You see, that was the other sin that Ezekiel worried about. It was happening in his period, so he's drawing upon the bad example of Sodom and Gomorrah before him. And it was neglect of the poor and the needy. Uh, In our day, we often divide left and right, uh, conservatives versus progressives and so on, Republicans versus Democrats, and one side seems to care more about moral issues, while the other side seems to care more about social issues. Well, guess which one God cares about? Both. And while sometimes we, we reduce Sodom to moral sins, yes, they were guilty of those. But they were also guilty of social sins. And it was neglect of the poor. The way Isaiah puts it here, same thing happened in his day. Because of the princes and the, the, the people in power, they're the ones that are trying to skim off the top. They are the ones leading to this kind of oppression of the poor. I mean, they want to stay on top for for a reason, right? There's the pride going to their heads. They want to be able to eat. They want to live high on the hog. I know that's a horrible analogy for for ancient Jews. But they want to to skim off the top. And so what are they going to do? Well, let's spoil the poor. Let's beat these people to pieces and grind their faces into the ground. Now, Isaiah, as you hopefully have come to expect, is drawing on some interesting imagery there. As a poet, it's amazing the kinds of symbols he uses. Because if you're trying to provide bread, remember, nobody has any. I mean, you're lucky to have any clothing. Will you be our leader? The bread is running out. This is a city under siege. We were trying to boast in our military might. Look at our horses. Look at our chariots. And yet... They're doing us no good because we're now trapped behind the city walls as the, the major outside influence and, and, and world superpower is bearing down on us. And now where are we going to go to grow food? We can't even go out to harvest the grain. But think about it in this way. What would you do to the grain to harvest it anyway? You would beat the wheat, right, to separate the kernel from the chaff. And then you would grind those kernels down into flour. Only then can you now bake your bread. So it's a matter of beating and grinding grain. But what are the rich doing? What are those in leadership doing? They're still beating and grinding. But they're beating the poor. They're grinding their faces It's as if they are trying to exact the bread they're eating from the sweat of the brow of other people. And this is the rich exploiting the poor and grinding them. In some ways, it's turned into cannibalism. 
It's the poor that are doing the, the beating and grinding of the grain, but then you're skimming off all that grain for yourselves. So in essence, you're grinding and beating the poor. And to imagine what's happening there, again, look around and see the exploitation of the poor in terms of labor practices so that the rich can keep getting richer at the expense of the poor. That's what's happening here. And again, whether it's the sins of commission that are often moral issues or the sins of omission, which are awful, often social issues, God is commanding his people to rise above them both. We've got to be better at loving God enough to overcome moral sins and loving neighbor enough to overcome social sins. Otherwise, we'll be like Sodom and Gomorrah in one way or another, including in their demise. Now, where is all this money going? We're grinding the poor. We're beating them to nothing. They're the chaff. We want the wheat. And what are we going to spend it all on? Well, on ourselves, but in what way? Look at verse 16. Because the daughters of Zion are haughty. And this is not H-O-T-T-Y. No, this is H-A-U-G-H-T-Y. Okay? And this isn't just a gendered issue. Okay? Men are just as prone to being prideful, uh, be, being haughty in certain areas. They're going to manifest in different ways. But they don't, don't assume he's just talking to females here. Men and women both have to overcome these kinds of prideful sins. Materialism, worldliness, we've all got to overcome it. But here let's use the daughters of Zion as our metaphor. They're haughty. They walk with stretched forth necks and wanton eyes, walking and mincing as they go, making a tinkling with their feet. I've sometimes asked seminary kids back in the day, teenagers are usually a little more willing to do something goofy, and ask them to act out that verse. What would it look like to be walking and mincing? I don't even know what that means, but that's okay. Imagine it. What would it look like to you? Making a tinkling with their feet. Well, what's tinkling there? Keep reading. And from verse 17 to 23, oh, it's really interesting to see what God is going to do to bring them to their senses. It, again, will illustrate what they're doing and then what God's going to do in response. Therefore, the Lord will smite with a scab the crown of the head of the daughters of Zion. Oh, they're not quite as as appealing to the eye now as they used to be, right? I mean, they came out haughty, wanting all eyes on them. But now that on the crown of their head is this nasty scab, ooh, I want to go hide myself. Is there a mountain? Is there a hole in the rock? Is there a cave I can go and powder my nose? Well, the Lord will discover their secret parts. So yeah, you can run, but you can't hide. You can't hide the real you. God's going to make sure of that. Because as Isaiah says, in that day, the Lord will take away the bravery. And bravery there, now it's just pride. Take away the pride of their tinkling ornaments. And calls and round tires like the moon. The chains and the bracelets and the mufflers. The bonnets and the ornaments of the legs and the headbands and the tablets and the earrings. The rings and nose jewels. The changeable suits of apparel and the mantles and the wimples and the crisping pins. The glasses and the fine linen and hoods and the veils. Now, that's a long passage. And Isaiah goes off on his rhyming there. He's just turning pages on the Sears catalog when that existed, or the Wells Fargo wagon when that existed, or whatever is now popping up in your social media feed of things that the algorithms assume you really want. Yeah, it's interesting, all these things. It's funny because you can look at that list and go, what? I mean, half the time it sounds like we're looking for car parts, right? The mufflers and the round tires and so on. But no, these are some kinds of jewels, baubles, and whatever they are that the daughters of Zion, ooh, Zion, they should know better. You were raised in righteousness. You were born to be a peculiar people, but now you just want to fit in. You want to look like anyone else. What's the latest style? A wimple? A crisping pin? 
That's actually why I prefer the King James translation to this. You can look up modern translations and see what these Hebrew words now mean. I mean, it would be interesting to look in Isaiah's day. What did wealthy and worldly women wear? And it's going to be a certain style. Now, fast forward it to 1611, when the King James translators take all this in hand. And they're thinking, okay, that old stuff is so, that is like so, 8th century BC. Uh, so it's, nobody wears that anymore. But what do they now wear in the courts of St. James? And it's mantles and wimples and crisping pins. Now, in the 2020s, where we are today, nobody's wearing mantles and wimples and crisping pins anymore. But what, in some ways, it'd be interesting to make your own translation. Not from the original Hebrew, nor from the 17th century King James. Or, and nor from the 2020, or the, the more modern translations you can find online. No, just look around. And what would you put on this list as the daughters of Zion are going out to try to convince a wicked world that I want, to be, I want to be just like you. I want to fit in. There's actually some horrible parallels in the ancient world where if you're about to be destroyed and your city's under siege and there's no bread and there's no water and there's no clothing and anything else, send the women out dressed to the nines in hopes that the marauding army will accept them as some kind of tribute payment and instead of wreaking havoc on the men cowering like cowards in the city, they will satisfy their appetites with the dainties that are being sent out to appease them. And then maybe they'll be merciful to the rest of the city. This is disgusting social practice that Isaiah is drawing upon but saying that's exactly what you're doing. In, in a literal way, you're going to be doing these things to try to appease Assyria or appease Babylon or keep fast forwarding, appease the Greeks, appease the Romans, appease anybody. In our day, are we still trying to appease the wicked world? If that's the literal, then take it to the symbolic. And are we sending out our most precious people, daughters of Zion, and allowing them to be ravaged by a wicked world that doesn't care about them at all. It's tragic that social media is preying upon our daughters even more than upon our sons because they don't have the latest wimple. They're sadly devoid of, of the latest crisping pin. What words would you put in place of these ones? What does everybody have to have these days to fit in? Because that's the kind of wickedness and worldliness that we have to learn to overcome. If we're ever going to flow up to the mountain of the Lord, we'll have to be different and choose to be, to be God's peculiar people. Now, what's God going to do in all of this, the end of this chapter is fascinating because to me, it feels like God is taking these people and turning them inside out. You see, usually if we only want people to look skin deep, it's because there's not much beneath the surface worth looking at. Uh, and so please only see this, only see the exterior. The interior is nothing to brag about. And what's the Lord going to do? The Lord looketh upon the heart, right? Not the outward appearance. He wants us to look at the heart. He wants us to get past the outward uh, appearance, ours as well as everyone else's. And so instead of being enamored by the exterior that's in front of you, let's turn it all inside out so that you see, oh, yikes, that's what I'm looking at? All the makeup's been washed off, okay? And I'm seeing the real thing underneath. The way he puts it in verse 24 to 26, it shall come to pass, instead of sweet smell, there shall be stink. Instead of a girdle, a rent, a torn piece of clothing, that is. Instead of well-set hair, baldness. 
and instead of a stomacher, a girding of sackcloth, burning instead of beauty. Thy men shall fall by the sword, and thy mighty in the war, and her gates shall lament and mourn, and she shall be desolate, and shall sit upon the ground. Oh, I've been warning you over and over that the proud would be humbled. And that's what's happening here. I'm chopping down trees. I'm taking people that are so well perfumed and then washing off all of that because it's just, this is fish and roses. It's just hiding the stench from underneath. We're taking these beautiful clothing, this beautiful clothing on the outside and tearing it apart. Oh, it's not just a scab on your head. There's nothing on your scalp. You're bald. Take the wig off, my dear. I mean, it's, it's burning instead of beauty. Now, if you can pause for just a moment, because back in Isaiah's, if you take all that Isaiah says, what will he say by the end of his book? That God can make beauty from ashes. Uh, that seems to reverse what we're seeing here at the end of Isaiah 3. Your beauty went to burning, left you with nothing left but ash. But don't worry. God can work with that. Scarlet sin can be white as snow. Ashes can be made beautiful again. And not the merely exterior beauty that these daughters of Zion were hiding behind. No, real beauty. That's so more than skin deep. Well, that's far off in the future. That's going to require a whole lot of repentance along the way. But it is repentance and redemption that the God of Israel promises his people, if they'll only accept it. You'll see hints of that in chapter 14 of 2 Nephi, also known as Isaiah chapter 4. In verse 1, In that day seven women shall take hold of one man. And too often people take this as some kind of sign of plural marriage being brought back in the last days. I wouldn't run to that conclusion. Just like we saw in, chap in the previous chapter, everyone's rushing for anyone with clothing. Like, hey, will you lead us? Here he's just altering the metaphor. All these women looking for anyone to protect them. They run and they say, we will eat our own bread. We'll wear our own apparel. Evidently, you don't have any of that to share anyway. But please, only let us be called by thy name to take away our reproach. This, again, it's not polygamy here. It's sheer desperation. We're not asking to be provided for. Again, you got nothing to give in that regard. But if all you, you got a name at least, can I take that? Can I not be found single when all is said and done? Can I at least be part of something? But there's the irony. Everybody here wants a name. Huh. You've already been offered one. If you're looking for a husband, the God of Israel is the bridegroom. You, Israel, you're the bride. Why? There's no bill of your mother's divorcement. You don't have to go look around for someone else to take their name. I'm yours if you'll be mine. He says in verse 2, In that day, which again is a nod to the latter day, shall the branch of the Lord be beautiful and glorious. Someday it's going to be okay. Someday these things will turn around. Someday we'll get back to the beginning of chapter 12, or Isaiah 2, where it's the mountain of the Lord and all nations are coming. The, there's something about a branch that's going to do that. Trees have been chopped down left and right, cedars of Lebanon, oaks of Bashan, but there will be branches that are still growing. And this one will be the Lord's branch. It will be beautiful. It will be glorious. The fruit of the earth will be excellent and comely to them that are escaped of Israel. Mm, you've escaped sin. You've escaped its awful consequences. Jacob's language, you've escaped the awful monster, sin and death. And it shall come to pass that they that are left in Zion and remain in Jerusalem. You get in a sense there's a, a remnant that remains? These are the survivors, and they shall be called holy. Everyone that is written among the living 
in Jerusalem. They've avoided spiritual death. They're still standing when so many others have fallen. They smell good. It's not just perfume. They are clothed by the Lord. It's not just stomachers and girdles that will be reduced to sackcloth and ashes. No, these are the righteous, and it's a righteous remnant. And when will they fully appear? When the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion, and shall have purged the blood of Jerusalem from the midst thereof, by the spirit of judgment and by the spirit of burning. You see, it's that burning that reduces beauty to, to ashes. It's that burning that turns us inside out so we can fully expose what needs to be burned away. This is the dross being consumed in the refiner's fire. And the Israelites, oh, they're, they're facing a refiner's fire as Isaiah speaks. Talk about judgment. Talk about burning. And how will we remain? How will we survive? Notice verse 5 and 6. This is beautiful. Chapter 4 of Isaiah, or chapter 14 of 2 Nephi, it's so short. Six little verses. But man, it gives you hope. This is the beginning of that one chapter that Nephi gives us that encompasses 2 and 3 and 4 and soon to see 5. But it's a reminder of, of where he started. The mountain of the Lord's house. Flow up to it. Or as he puts it in verse 5 and 6 here, the Lord will create upon every dwelling place of Mount Zion and upon her assemblies. Notice the difference there. It's one thing for all the church to come together in an assembly and for God to honor that and claim it as his own. But for that to happen on every single dwelling place, it's not just the stakes of Zion, not just the wards of Zion. It's the families of Zion, the homes of Zion. And upon every one of them, notice what God will give. A cloud and smoke by day and the shining of a flaming fire by night. For upon all the glory of Zion shall be a defense. And that's what we need as the approaching armies are bearing down on us. We need a defense. There shall be a tabernacle for a shadow in the daytime from the heat. Let me rhyme that. For a place of refuge. Let me rhyme that. And a covert from storm and from rain. Oh, do you get the imagery there? We're back to the mountain of the Lord. Mountains are places of safety. Mountains are easier to defend because the approaching army has to run uphill. You have higher moral ground you're on. You're not looking down on people in pride. You're looking down upon enemies that will have a hard time reaching you because you're in a place of security. Notice he makes it obvious. He drops the obvious hint when he calls it a tabernacle uh, and talks about clouds of smoke and pillars of flaming fire because now we're back to the Exodus, which is Isaiah's favorite precedent to follow. Isaiah harkens back to the Exodus all the time. Nephi has done the same. wonder where he learned it. And to realize that, oh, things were bleak for the ancient Israelites too, but their God came to deliver them if they would just choose to follow. Follow him where? Through the wilderness, where a cloud of smoke and a pillar of fire brought them, led them, descended upon their tabernacle, which was the center of everything for the ancient Israelites. The tent of testimony, it was called. Oh, a shelter of witness. Here, it's a refuge. It's home base when you're playing tag. It's a covert or covering when the storms hit, when the rains roll in. It's a beautiful image here. And again, it's not just that it's there at the assembly. In the early days of the church where everyone had to go to Nauvoo or everyone had to go to Salt Lake. Or even beyond it where, well, there's at least one temple for the East Coast. Make your, make your day trek to Washington, D.C. You in South America, hey, at least you've got one in Buenos Aires. All the European saints coming together in Switzerland, because that's as good as we've got. It's upon the assemblies. Well, thanks to President Kimball and then President Hunter uh, and President Hinckley and President Nelson is breaking all the records. Temples are beginning to dot the assemblies of Israel. 
but when will they dot the dwelling places? When will every home be a tabernacle, a temple, a mini mountain of the Lord? When will we be able to come into our own homes and know that here we are defended against the wicked world? It's getting harder and harder because it used to be at least wires were required to get outside influences in, but now the world is wireless. And we have to be able to decide for ourselves, will we establish in our dwelling place clouds of smoke and pillars of fire and tabernacles and refuges and places of defense and coverings, atoning coverings from the storm that's raging outside our walls. That's the goal. That's the promise. But Israel isn't doing it. It's what Isaiah gets at in his next chapter. His chapter 5, or Nephi's chapter 15. Here's a song of the Lord's vineyard. It will ring some bells if we remember our allegory of the olive tree from Zenos that Jacob will spend the longest chapter in the Book of Mormon quoting. But here's a, a brief preview. Verse 1 and 2. Then will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved, touching his vineyard. So this is a love song from prophet to the Lord that he loves, singing about something the Lord loves, namely his vineyard. My well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. And if it's a very fruitful hill, this is a promising location. In fact, it's a promised land. He fenced it. Picture that setting it apart from surrounding people. Yes, it's peculiar. It's just mine and gathering out the stones thereof. So he's removed any obstacles to prevent its growth. And he planted it with the choicest vine. And if it's the choicest vine, this is the greatest potential you could ask for. God has pulled out all the stops. He's trying to help you succeed. Not only that, but he built a tower in the midst of it. So there's protection. I'm sure this tower has a watchman on the tower after all. He's going to be able to see if some enemy beyond the fence is going to try to come in. But he also, notice this last detail, made a wine press therein. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes. And it did, that's the good news, but here's the bad news. It brought forth wild grapes. And with that, yeah, I hope we're thinking about the allegory of the olive tree. You see, if there's a wine press there, that last detail is essential because it proves that God has high hopes, great expectations for this vineyard of his. It's not meant to be a shade garden or merely an ornamental garden. It's a work vineyard. There's a wine press there. I expect productivity. True grapes, good grapes, bringing forth, oh, sacramental wine, if you're prepared for it. Well, unfortunately, its productivity is going in other directions. They seem to be feeding themselves, beating the poor, grinding their faces in the dust. It's wild grapes. This is not what I intended. So the Lord's question in verse 3, Now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard. That's an interesting question. I, I'll put myself in, in court. Feel free to sue me for negligence as the Lord of the vineyard. I, I just want to be sure whose fault is this? Is it that I didn't give my people a chance to progress or that they chose not to be productive? So you go ahead and judge between us. And here's this question. What could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? That question haunts the pages of Jacob chapter 5. This is parental regret. And I know I've felt that. Perhaps you have too. It's these unavoidable regrets of wondering, have I done everything I could? If I could go back and change that or do this differently, would my kids have turned out different than they have? Those kinds of things. And here it's God asking that. Could I have done anything different? Could I have done anything more? Wherefore? And remember, that word means why. So now he's asking this why question. Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, 
it brought forth wild grapes. Why did things turn out this way? I thought I did everything I could. Now, from personal experience, please understand that if you're a fixer, you're often a blamer as well. Because the fixing side of you, I want to spot problems so I can fix them. That's how I'm wired. But unfortunately, when you're spotting problems, you're often asking, why is it this way? And who did it? And who's to blame for this? And, and again, the fixers are the blamers. And that's the problem side of it. If you can spot problems without pointing fingers, that's a, that's a better place to be. Here the Lord is pointing the finger inward. Lord, is it I? Could I have done anything differently? Well, judge. And is this on God or is this on his people? Well, verse 5. Now go to. I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. Whether it's my fault or theirs, we're not going to just sit here and throw a pity party. We're going to keep working at it. We're going to keep digging and dunging and, and planting and pruning and weeding and watering and everything else that goes into real husbandry. Here's the plan. I will take away the hedge thereof. Hmm, he's going to remove his protective hand. It shall be eaten up. Hmm, there's Israel being devoured by conquering nations. I will break down the wall thereof, and it shall be trodden down. That is just a rhyme of what he said previously. And I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned and digged, but there shall come up briars and thorns. Ooh, where do we last see that? Think about the fallen world after the Garden of Eden. It's happening all over again. Israel is falling and refuses to get up. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. Think about that. God's chosen people no longer being showered with blessings. And then Isaiah makes it crystal clear just in case we missed the metaphor. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. Let me repeat that for clarity and for emphasis. The men of Judah are his pleasant plant. He looked for judgment. That's what he was after. That's what he was seeking. Righteous judgment. Doing the right thing. Vertically as well as horizontally. Uh, morally as well as socially. That's what I was hoping for, looking for. But behold, what did he see instead? Oppression. He was looking for righteousness. But behold, a cry. God got the opposite of what he was expecting. Not people grinding grain to feed the poor but grinding the poor to feed themselves. That's the problem. They are breaking both the first and second great commandments. But in this case, it's the second one he's more concerned about. Oppression instead of judgment. Cries of lamentation instead of songs of praise. Well, in verse 8, God gives them some woes. And they're similar to the woes that Jacob graced us with back in chapter 9. But what is God condemning? Woe unto them that join house to house, till there can be no place that they may be placed alone in the midst of the earth. In mine ears, said the Lord of hosts, of a truth many houses shall be desolate, and great and fair cities without inhabitant. Yea, ten acres of vineyard shall yield one bath. The seed of a homer shall yield an ephah. Now, for this, we're going to need to know some Jewish stuff, right? What's an ephah? What's a homer? What's a, a, a bath in their, in their terms? Well, we're trying to harvest something here, right? I mean, we need some bread after all. But the irony of this at the end there is ten acres worth, and all you got out of it was one bath? You had... A, the seed of a homer, and all you've got is an ephah? I'm not going to bore you with the, the details of the weights and measures, but basically what he's describing there is the most pathetic return on investment you could imagine. Ten acres worth. And what'd you end up with? Oh, you, you, you filled your water bottle? Oh, really? You had so much seed and planted it all throughout 
the fields. And what did you harvest? Less than what you started with. This is a negative return on investment. No wonder you're starving to death. No wonder you got no food to eat and just begging anyone with clothing or even just a name to try to lead us out of this self-inflicted mess. No, you see the problem there? This is why uh, Haggai talks about in that beautiful verse I love that you're planting, but you're not harvesting. You're eating, but you're still hungry. You're drinking, but you're still thirsty. You're putting on clothes, but you're still not warm. And you're earning wages to put it into a bag with holes. Remember that magnificent metaphor? Isaiah's hinting at the same thing. A bag with holes, no return on investment. There's some irony too in the at the beginning of that verse, in verse 8, where it talks about joining house to house so there is no place. I always think, no offense to San Francisco, I love San Francisco, my uh, grandparents lived uh, in the Bay Area and it's beautiful, but I always have this picture, it's probably from the old Full, the Full House TV show I watched when I was a kid, but it shows those townhomes in San Francisco with the city off in the distance. You know the picture I'm talking about, it's pretty famous. And it, it, townhomes are not unique to San Francisco by any stretch of the imagination. In fact, more and more people are living on less and less space. We're packing it in and you can, you don't have to go over to the neighbor's house to ask for an egg. You can just kind of reach out of your kitchen window into theirs and kind of pass it from that way. It's amazing how small properties are. Why? Well, I can pack them all in and developers can make more because I've got more houses per acre. And so now it's joining house to house, so there's no place. But that's the irony. It's all left desolate and without inhabitant. It's like, oh, you could have spread out so far you don't even hear the shotgun of your neighbor. Because there's nobody here. The Think about it. If the Assyrians, for example, that's the immediate situation in Isaiah's day. If the Assyrian Empire is coming to bear down on us, and here we are trying to eke out every little element from the soil so we can enrich ourselves. Oh, good luck. The day will come where there's nothing. We're trying to pack everybody in like sardines to make more money off real estate. And yet, it's not... Overpopulation won't be the problem. Underpopulation will. There's only going to be a little remnant of the righteous that remains. You see the way he puts it in verse 11. Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning, that they may follow strong drink, that continue until night and wine inflame them. How's that for hedonism that knows no end? This is morning till night. And when's my, where's my next drink coming from? Well, that's a good question since your vineyard has been horribly despoiled. You're not growing anything there. So yeah, good luck finding enough wine to inflame you from sun up to sundown. Meanwhile, the harp and the vial, the tabret and pipe and wine are in their feasts. Oh, you're eating it up. You're drinking it up. Toasts all around. Another round on the house. You're living as if there's no tomorrow and you'll never have to pay the piper. In fact, notice what they're doing. They're partying like party animals, but they regard not the work of the Lord neither consider the operation of his hands. Therefore, my people are gone into captivity because they have no knowledge and their honorable men are famished and their multitude dried up with thirst. Oh, again, a role reversal. You've gone from feast to famine. You've gone from drunkenness to drought. And it's all because you have no knowledge. No wonder God is sending prophets to increase your knowledge. No wonder Jesus himself says that if you know the truth, the truth will make you free. But that, the opposite must be true also. If knowledge of truth sets you free, then lack of knowledge is what brings captivity. I'm locked in a prison of my own ignorance and I don't have a key. Well, prophets do. 
And God is calling a prophet. We'll see that in the very next chapter. To be able to send them the news, the, the, the good news of redemption. The way out of this ignorance. Now from there, the Lord says a few more things about their pride and how he's going to bring it down. And then he mentions another sin in verse 18. Woe unto them that draw iniquity with cords of vanity and sin, as it were, with a cart rope. So there's a couplet. It says it twice. Picture you as a beast of burden and you as the ox, you as the, as the horse. You are drawing a, a cartload of something. Now you would think that this would be oh, the, the harvest of the fields, but no, you're drawing iniquity behind you. You're connected to it with cords of vanity. That's so interesting. Wanting to keep on sinning so you can keep on looking good. How's that for cords of vanity? You care so much how the mocking masses in the great and spacious building look on you and think about you. That you'll tie yourself to the very thing that's tying you down and holding you back. Woe to them, but also woe to those that say, let him make speed, hasten his work, that we may see it, and let the counsel of the Holy One of Israel draw nigh and come, that we may know it. You see what they're, speaking of mocking, see what they're doing there? They're making fun of this prophetic promise that, oh, no, don't, you will pay the piper, or redemption will someday come if we're prepared for it. And they're like, yeah, right. Oh, hurry up, God, we're waiting. Hasten his work. It's so invisible to us. We just want to see it. We just want to know it. Oh, no, they don't. Because in the meantime, notice the next woe. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. That put darkness for light and light for darkness. That put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. I've heard this referred to as topsy-turvy morality. If God is taking the wicked and turning them inside out, the world is taking the righteous and turning it upside down. To say what, whatever God says is right, we'll say is wrong. And vice versa. Whatever God says is sweet, like the fruit of the tree of life. Oh, no, no, no. We'll say that's bitter. And then we'll take the bitter and replace it. Or I should say, rename it sweet. On the one hand, you think, that's impossible. How, do you, how would you even do that? They're going to catch it on the way. But as Elder Hales has taught from his experience as a fighter pilot, there really is such a thing as spiritual vertigo. Where in literal vertigo, you can, if you're not paying attention to your instruments, the plane could become completely upside down and you don't sense it. The change is so gradual. And to think about the, the, the spiritual vertigo we're, we're dealing with in our day. Where evil is now being relabeled good. And good is being relabeled evil. Imagine medicine and poison where the labels are mixed up. And what is meant to help you ends up harming you. That, that's a dangerous place to be in. But that's, the, that's what Isaiah's people are dealing with. It's what we're dealing with in our own day. And the worst part of it all is that we don't want that to change. We don't want to go back to God. We don't want to honor the truth that comes from Him. And as a result, because we want it this way, God tends to honor our agency. Oh, you'd prefer to live without God in the world? And I guess I'll have to excuse myself. Lamentably. And I'll leave you to your own devices. You think there's enough flesh on your arm? So be it. I'll leave you and your arm alone. That's what Isaiah says in the aftermath of verse 20. But then he gets to verse 26 and says something fascinating. This can be seen as good news or bad news, depending on how we're reading it. It's probably an element of both. But look at 26 through 29. He will lift up an ensign. There's a flag. To the nations from far. It's going to be up there high enough on his holy mountain that the world can see it from a distance. Okay? In case they can't see it, but at least might be able to hear from a distance, he will hiss unto them from the end of the earth. 
And the hiss there is one of those whistles that people can do when they put their fingers in their mouth and it's so high, it's just this high pitched piercing hiss. I can't do that, but I've got friends who can. God evidently can. His prophets can. So here's the flag. Here's the whistle. All eyes on me. All eyes on Israel. And what's the message now that he's got their attention? Behold, they shall come with speed swiftly. None shall be weary nor stumble among them. None shall slumber nor sleep. Neither shall the girdle of their loins be loosed, nor the latchet of their shoes be broken. You get this? Nothing's going to slow them down. They're not asleep. They don't have to be roused or wakened. It's like, no, I'm, I'm already in the three-point stance. I am ready to sprint off the starting line to come running wherever God would have me go. The girdle of my loins won't be loose. I won't be tripping up over my, over my robes. The latchet of my shoe won't be broken. No, no broken shoelaces, okay? Nothing to trip me up. Keep reading. Whose arrows shall be sharp and all their bows bent. You picture that mental image? The bow's already bent. They're ready to let this arrow fly and the arrow's sharp. It will reach the target. It will penetrate whatever they're aiming at. Another element of speed. The horse's hooves shall be counted like flint. Their wheels like a whirlwind. They're roaring like a lion. They shall roar like young lions. Yea, they shall roar and lay hold of the prey and shall carry away safe and none shall deliver. That is an intense image that Isaiah is painting there. You see, it's here that we're going to take a break in today's material. It's here that there's a chapter break in Nephi's original arrangement. It's here that we're going to pause before we move forward and see what God is going to do about all this. And in some ways, the passage we just read could be a pivot passage, a pivot point, because it really could go in either direction. You see, in the original context here, this is bad news. Uh, Israel won't pay attention to anything, and so, well, I guess God's going to have to come on a little stronger. No still small voice? Okay, how about speaking from the whirlwind? No willingness to change? The, well, like we've said, if God will have a humble people. You can choose to be or can be compelled to be. And they're not choosing to be, right? These are the, the cedars of Lebanon. Then I'm going to have to cut you down. These are the oaks of Bashan. Then I'm going to have to level you to the ground. If you will not turn to the Lord of hosts, then the hosts of surrounding armies will come in to bring you to your knees. And God is calling them here. In immediate context, God is calling the surrounding nations to come and lay Israel low. He's blowing the whistle. He's raising the flag. And he's telling the armies arrayed against Israel to come with sharp arrows and bent bows because Israel is going to be destroyed. It deserves it. It has sown the wind and will now reap the whirlwind. It's the law of the harvest. I've warned you about that from the beginning. Now that's the bad news. And it will come to pass in the form of the Assyrian Empire. You want to talk about bent bows and sharp arrows? Look no further than the Assyrians. You want to talk about lions roaring and laying hold of prey and nobody can free them, deliver them? Well, that's, that's the Assyrian army. It's the first real world superpower. And it's coming. That's what's going on in Isaiah's day. But you know how God can always take ash and bring beauty out of it? That God can take this a kingdom that's or a nation that's been reduced not only to rubble, but been reduced to a remnant. Oh, but then what can God do with that remnant? With that remnant, even Israel as it's scattered, the northern kingdom will be scattered by the Assyrians. And remember, the Assyrian approach to world domination is to shuffle the deck. It's to take all these conquered peoples and then move them around so that they intermix and intermarry, and now there's not really a, an ide a sense of identity to fight for. They're not in the homeland that they're trying to liberate. No, you don't even know who you are anymore, or where you are, or whose you are, and so <laughs> you're an Assyrian subject and will forever remain. Nobody's, 
delivering this prey from the lion. But then again, remember in the second part of Isaiah, the reassuring, redemptive portions, who will deliver the prey from the mighty? Mm, God can. Who can deliver the lawful captives? Oh yeah, you deserve this destruction. You asked for it. But ah, my mercy, my loving kindness can draw you back out. Yes, you've been scattered, but yes, you'll be gathered. You're captive, but you'll be delivered. That You'll die, but you'll be resurrected. You'll sin, but you'll be released from sin and death. You yeah, understand how it's all coming together? And right here, as Isaiah is about to make this pivot, and as Nephi is about to make this pivot, with the calling of a prophet, this fascinating passage about, okay, army, come. But then in this beautiful dualism that Isaiah is such a genius with, could this also be good news? Is it just an enemy army that's being summoned? Or in some later day, when we're making the great reversals, could it be a different army that's on its way? Could the Lord have a different ensign to raise and a different whistle to hiss as he calls for a different kind of soldier to come rushing in? Yes, still with bows bent and arrows sharp, still with horses hooves like flint. Can you imagine the sparks flying off the cobblestone? Wheels like a whirlwind. I had a missionary in the MTC 30 years ago when I was teaching there, who was awesome. And he told me, I asked the missionaries at one point, tell me, let's go around the, the circle in the district and everybody share their, the, the verse of scripture they put on their missionary plaque. I think it's an interesting insight into what makes that missionary tick, what they hope their mission might be. And we heard them all, but the one that stuck in my mind was from this one very impressive young elder who chose those verses for his missionary plaque. And I'm all, you went with Isaiah? Impressive. What'd you get out of that? And this is definitely a more Latter-day Saint interpretation uh, than what the biblical scholars would give. It's definitely more of a last days view of this rather than an Isaiah's original context view. But remember, Isaiah had the, the layer cake and what might apply in his day could also apply in Christ's day, could also apply in the last day. It's, he gets a lot of mileage out of one metaphor. And this amazing missionary just described these verses and said, that's the kind of missionary I want to be. I want to be in the Lord's army and I want nothing to slow me down. I never want to be asleep on the job. I never want to get weary in my well-doing. Oh, I don't want my robe to come loose or my shoes to get untied. I want to be a polished shaft in the quiver of the Almighty. I want him to know that I will go exactly where he aims and his aim is perfect. And if I can be a sharp arrow in his bent bow, Oh, just wait for the lion to roar. God will do great things for his people Israel through his army of the anointed. Bank on that because that's the promise of God.